welcome to the Photo Flunky Show, episode number 56. Today we're going to be talking about how to photograph fireworks. New Year's Eve is coming up, and who knows, maybe this will still be good for a replay when the 4th of July comes around. Yep. Thank you very much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. My name is William Beam. Hey, my name is Lee Beam. And we I think we've got a wonderful show for you tonight. At least it's something that a lot of people like to do. There's only, for most people, I think, in the USA, there's really only two occasions when you're really going out shooting fireworks, and that's either New Year's Eve or Independence Day. Yes. Internationally, I, I know fireworks are going off. I don't know how often they're going to go off. I think that varies on, on what the celebrations are. Yeah, I guess it does. And except the exceptions are going to be at Disney parks, which is where we live in Orlando. There are fireworks every day of the year. So we've actually been practicing this quite a lot. And I'm hoping that we've got something to share with you that will make sense. Yes. And I love shooting fireworks. Fire, fireworks is fun. And the nice part about it is you don't really have to have expensive, awesome gear in order to get fireworks photos that look really, really good. You don't. And although not every time it's going to be perfect, once once you get the basics of the settings and how to set up for it, it's really easy. It really is. So we want to go and get into that. But before I do that, let me just take care of a little bit of business. I want to let you know that show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 56, including some of our fireworks shots. Yes. We want to give some examples of things we've been talking about. You can find a transcript of the show there for free. And if you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, we would really love to have join us. So go to photoflunky.com. You'll find a, a podcast player there that's got a lot of episodes. And also there are links there to subscribe to the show. So whether you want to be on iTunes or Google Play or something else, we've got a few different ways that you can get there. And finally, there are links on the website at williambeam.com to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And you know what? I need to add my YouTube channel. Now I'm starting to record a lot of videos for YouTube this week and next yeah, week. Yeah, if you guys download the transcript, the YouTube link is actually in there now as standard. All right. That sounds outstanding. And if you've got requests for something you want to know, leave me a comment. Let me know either the contact form on the webpage at williambeam.com slash contact or leave a comment at uh, williambeam.com slash episode 56. I'd, I'd love to hear from you. And so why do you want to shoot fireworks? Honestly, fireworks are fun to watch, but when you capture them, you kind of get, you have a chance to get something that's even a little bit different than the show. Yes, it is. Because when you're watching the show, you see you know, one set of bursts at a time. When you've got a long exposure, you get all these bursts almost overlaid during the course of the exposure. So the sky is more colorful in the photo than what it will be in real life. Yeah. There, and there are times like at the end of most shows, there's going to be a grand finale with a lot of bursts going off. The problem is when they do that, it usually overwhelms the sensor. It's extraordinarily bright. Yes. So one of the smartest things you can do is actually kind of capture the experience with a long exposure and get multiple bursts on the same frame. And you come up with something unique because every photographer is going to time it differently. That's true. You're going to, yeah. you're going to end up with shots that no one else is going to have. And the fact that the show will go on for a while, you've got more than one chance to get it right. You might be doing long exposures, not throughout the length of the show as one exposure, but multiple chances of long exposures throughout the night. That's true. You can play around with it, have a quick glimpse when it flashes up on the back of the screen. And if you're not happy, adjust accordingly. As far as the gear you need, let's start off with the basic. You need a camera with manual controls. It doesn't have to be a DSLR. It can be mirrorless, it can be DSLR, it can be micro four thirds. It can be an all-in-one camera, so long as you have control over your exposure triangle. If you've got your ISO, your aperture, and your shutter speed, if you can control all of that the way you need to, then your camera's probably gonna be fine. It doesn't have to be a big expensive one. That's true, yes. And we've seen people try to handhold their uh, camera for photographs of fireworks, and I'm gonna tell you, don't do that. Well, it just doesn't work. You get these little squiggly things and this black sky and a bit of smoke and a bit of blur. Yeah, it's it's kind of like an art trip on acid. <laughs> yeah. Or an acid trip on art. I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I think it works both ways. <laughs> so we're going to definitely recommend that you get a tripod. And I mean a tripod that hits the ground, not a little, what do you call it, a gorilla pod or one of these little things that you put on a tabletop tripod. The reason I'm recommending that you get a sturdy tripod is because... You want something in case there is a breeze that will keep your camera stable yes. because you're going to be doing long exposures, you know, three, four seconds, maybe even longer than that. And the longer it's it, the exposure is open and the shutter is up and you're taking it in light, the greater chance you have of something introducing vibration. That's true. And that's just going to make for blurry photos. Yes. So railings and surfaces like that are a little bit more risky, especially if you, you're expecting a lot of people around generally when there's a fireworks event. Yeah. We've got friends that uh, will go out to Walt Disney World and try and sit up on a trash can. 
and they're taking their long dis their long exposure and then someone wants to throw something away <laughs> yeah um i mean imagine wanting to use the trash can while someone's taking a photo with it and you can't argue with them it's a trash can you know so bring your own tripod make sure you set it up and it doesn't have to be the biggest tripod in the world it just needs to be big enough and stable enough for whatever camera that you're using that's true and because fireworks are up it, it almost doesn't matter if it's not that tall no it really doesn't no we're going to recommend that you get some kind of a remote release and honestly i prefer a shutter release cable yes i prefer the cable as well i mean i know that you can do this with uh, infrared remotes or you can even do it with uh, wireless remotes but there's a, there's a little something with a cable that i like better one is some of the infrareds you were saying on previously. the front of the camera, it's kind of awkward to try and lean around. You just, uh, you actually risk bumping the camera yourself because you're trying to straddle one of, at least one of the legs of the tripod. So it's just a bit awkward. The nice part is you don't really want to have your eye up against the frame. I mean, you've already selected your composition by the time the fireworks are going yes. off. So you know what your elements are going to be. And it's going to, you just want to watch the show and watch for the burst. And then you want to have the cable in your hand and you want to click a button and then release it. Or maybe you want to click it and lock it for a certain period of time and then move something on or off your lens, you know, to capture light or block light. Yes. But the idea is remote ones don't necessarily always let you shoot on bulb, which if you want to do like a 30 second or more exposure, you need to be in bulb mode on, on most uh, cameras. That's true. And you don't necessarily need that long. 10 seconds will give you, you know, it depends. decent one, depending on the show. It depends on the show and it depends on how many different bursts that you want to get in. Some of the bursts may go up and you say, you know what, that's not what I want. So you don't... Um, unblock your lens yeah you kind of can leave it open there for a couple of minutes but if it's blocked by the next thing we're going to recommend is kind of like a i use a black ball cap but you can use a dark cloth or something something that blocks light from coming into the lens yes so that way it doesn't matter how long your exposure is open because you're not gathering light you're not generating noise and you're only opening up for the time when the bursts that you want are going off that's true yeah the nice part about the cable is that it gives you control without touching your camera and introducing vibration Whereas some of the remote releases, they'll let you click the release and maybe there's a timer that it snaps on and off. Even when that timer snaps, there's a bit of a jerk when it stops. You need to look at your setup, look at the camera, look at what's available in terms of cable releases or remote releases, whatever your preference is. And if, I guess you work with what you have and you buy what you can afford. And the nice thing about cable releases, they're less likely to have interference from someone else. Well, they don't run on batteries either. Yeah, it's like there's there's really not much that can go wrong with the cable. Whereas I've seen people that are working even with Pocket Wizard, somebody's triggering somebody else's. Oh damn! Wireless. Oh yeah. no! <laughs> so you That's imagine, not like, funny. You you click the shutter and then someone else clicks theirs. It's like wait, that wasn't <laughs> what I wanted. It's like it's it's less likely these days. But you know what? Nobody's going to interfere with your cable. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes old school is really is best. All right, we're going to recommend that when you're shooting, you want to shoot at a low ISO to avoid noise. Yeah. This is not something where you want to crank your aperture wide open or you want to move your ISO way up. You want to have nice, clean images, and you're going for the long exposure. So you're going to stop yeah. down. Well, you do, but it's not just to avoid noise. The reason that I turn the ISO as low as my camera will take it is partly because of the exposure triangle. I want that exposure to be letting in as little light as possible so I can leave it open for longer. And that's why we're stopping down, and you don't need to have a big, fast glass. I mean, you can use it if you want to, but you're really going to be shooting at a very small aperture. Yep, yeah, I think the widest I go is I've once or twice done f11 with a very dark de neutral density filter but generally it's f14 to f18 for my fireworks and I'm leave it of, open for about 45 seconds yeah i'm kind of right there at f16 because i, I know that i want to let in a little bit of light at a time and i'm going to be if i'm doing multiple exposures on the same frame you know just moving that hat on and off the lens is kind of like when the bursts go up it's going to build up to a point and i'm kind of calculating in my head as to how many seconds makes an exposure for whatever the rest of the environment is going to be yes and here's another thing when you're focusing this is actually quite important if you've got autofocus and manual focus on your camera use the autofocus you preferably have some kind of subject there as a foreground for your firework shots focus in on that lock the focus in switch it to manual because otherwise in the, the low light the camera starts hunting and then it doesn't always trigger the shutter release when you hit the when you press the button. I agree with that. You definitely want to be on manual focus because as soon as it starts hunting, if you hear your particularly if you've got a silent <laughs> auto focus and you don't yes. hear it hunting, wait till you get back and say, Why is this all blurry? But focus at first because usually what happens is wherever you are, the lights get dimmed before the fireworks start. Mm -hmm. So do it while it's still light. Also, and I've made this mistake, get your shutter release cable into the correct place. 
before the lights go down because I've also come unstuck with that and been just trying to sit with the light from a phone to see where it went in. <laughs> and, you know, that's another thing. If you have a little um, door on your viewfinder glass to keep light from leaking in back there, make sure you close off your viewfinder because light can leak into your sensor from the viewfinder while the shutter is open. Oh, so what is for? That's what it's for. Oh, I threw it back in the box. I didn't know what it was for. I thought it came with the packaging, like a protective. <laughs> no, on my camera, it's built into the camera. So I, I just slide this little thing and it blocks off the viewfinder. So you want to block that off so you don't get additional light. I don't know if this light. attaches. I just remember throwing that in the box and thinking, what the hell? Well, okay. there you go. And finally, we're going to kind of recommend going with a wide angle lens because usually you're trying to get an environment inside of your fireworks. If you've ever seen photographs of just fireworks in the sky, they're boring as hell. That's true. Unless, of course, you're shooting where you, you know from way off somewhere and you've got a big, like maybe a bridge or a big landmark building that's there that you want to get as a feature. If you're far away, you could probably adjust. But yeah, if you're generally, if you're sitting in the, the common viewing area, um, you're going to want to go wide. There are times, I think, in some cities where a long lens make can make sense. If you really want to compress together the buildings and you want the fireworks kind of right in there, New York City would be or Chicago would be a place like that where you've got those wonderful tall buildings mm -hmm. and you've got access to a rooftop someplace and you just want to kind of crunch it all in. Maybe yeah. even Las Vegas might be a nice place, but we've got a skyline. But for the most of us, I would say a wide angle is really what you want to look at. Yes. Let's kind of get into the next one is scouting your location. Where do you want to be? And that depends upon your location itself. Sometimes I think photographs of fireworks look really nice if you're actually further away from them and you can shoot maybe overlooking the city or the skyline that you're at and seeing the fireworks going above them. I've done that a, a few times. That's nice. If you're going to be closer into the environment, then I think you're going to be looking for elements that are being going to be in your foreground and background. Mm -hmm. So think about your rest, the rest of your photography is usually going to be you want to have a foreground, a middle, and a background. Well, your fireworks might be your background, or in some cases, they might be your middle. You're probably not going to be your foreground. Well, no, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> if you're that close, I hope you're wearing protective clothing. Yes. It's still the same. The same photography rules applies. It's not just about the fireworks. It's about the fireworks at a particular place. So find some element that says, I am here. San Francisco photographers like to shoot over the Golden Gate Bridge or maybe the Transamerica building or something. Your that landmark. Says, a little bit of homework with something like this goes a long way. It doesn't take a long time to do research, or maybe it does, depending on how specific you are about what you want. But look at shows that have been put on in that location over previous years. Have a look at some examples of photos, try and figure out where the person was standing, and then decide based on that. And look at YouTube videos. This is something that Lee's brought up a number of times, but it really is good even before you go to your location, look for videos of fireworks at that location. And they may shoot from multiple angles, but then you've got a couple of different ideas. And you may even say, you know what, I don't want to shoot from where they shot on the video, but I see a spot where I would like to be. And you possibly want to pick your lens based on the type of show that's put on, because they vary so widely. I mean, fireworks are, it's like confetti. It can go anywhere. It really can. The other part we're going to recommend is be prepared to wait. You want to get to your spot early enough that you can set up before it gets too dark, you want to take some test shots. So you want to make sure that you've got your foreground element or whatever your environment is that you're photographing. You want to do some long exposure test shots and get a feel for how long it's going to take yes. and what your sh aperture and shutter speed is going to be. Also, sometimes you may want to take a shot of your foreground element or environment before the fireworks start, because if you want to go into Photoshop later and kind of layer them in and then just put the bursts over that, you need to have a tripod and a stable environment. And that way you can... Just say, okay, I know that I've got photographs that are in exactly the same composition and I can just layer them in Photoshop and kind of brush in what I want or what I don't yeah, want. Yeah, the great thing about a tripod, I mean, that's all too clever for me. I don't do that, but I, I can, I've, I've watched you do some and it's beautiful. It gives you options. Yes. If you take a photograph of your environment before the fireworks go off if, and you're comfortable with Photoshop, it gives you options to kind of create fireworks and move yes. them around where you want. So maybe you don't get exactly what was there. It's, well, maybe you don't get exactly what you want in one shot, but over the series of shots you've taken, you may be able to put it together. Well, here's part of the reason why. When you get into shooting fireworks, these are explosions. Explosions make smoke, and the smoke may blur or obscure part of what you want to see. They can also enhance what you want. You know, particulate matter in the air can be very interesting, especially when some of the fireworks start glowing through the smoke. Yes. But if you want that perfect, pristine firework shot over a city, sometimes that might be a composite image. That's true. It's not that you have to do it, but it gives you options if you've taken a photograph of the environment or landscape before the first shot goes off. Yeah. We mentioned the grand finale, and this is one of those things that 
I think by the time the grand finale comes around, you just kind of want to stop taking photographs and watch and enjoy it because it's overwhelms the sensor in most cases. I tend to try and shut it off before it gets there. And you can normally feel the buildup. If there's music or even the fireworks almost lead you into it, you, you get a feel for when it's coming. And that's probably the time to stop the exposure. You can take a chance, but at least you know that if you lose it, you've, you haven't wrecked the previous shot. After the fireworks are over, you've packed up and you go home. You're not complete yet. Now you need to do a little bit of post-processing to really make your photographs stand out. Yes. What I like to do is very simple. I'll, I'll usually go into Lightroom or some raw processor. I am going to, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure I've got some contrast. I want my sky to be dark. I want my blacks to be there. And I want the fireworks to stand out a bit more. So you add some contrast, you're definitely making your fireworks stand out. The other thing you want to do is you want to sharpen your photos and you want to add some vibrance or some saturation to make the colors in those fireworks really stand out. Yeah, It's one thing to see just some, you know, kind of off-white lights streaking up, which is what it might look like out of the camera. But once you put in amp the uh, saturation of the color or vibrance, whatever sliders you've got, that kind of really makes it, ooh, there's some greens and reds and blues in there. You start to experience something that maybe you, maybe you saw, maybe you didn't. But when you're looking at a static photograph, you want that to kind of... You want it to pop out at whoever's going to be looking at it. Yes, you do. You want those vibrant colors. And in Lightroom, this is going to vary depending on what post-processing software you use, but I definitely prefer the vibrance to saturation. I almost never touch the saturation slider. Usually it's to drop the saturation a bit. If I use saturation in Lightroom, I'm probably going to do it on an adjustment brush. So I'm only going to do it over the fireworks themselves. I'm, okay. I, because if your environment, you don't want to see like electric colors coming out of everything. It, it, it doesn't look right. So I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing global adjustments to everything when you're really, what you're trying to do is enhance the fireworks shots themselves. That's true. So do your global for the environment and then do your adjustment brush changes for the fireworks themselves. And with that, I think you probably have everything you need to get some really good fireworks. It takes a little bit of practice. You kind of get into your timing. I usually like to go for three to four seconds, maybe six seconds tops for my burst going up because this is a long exposure. The fireworks, you don't, you don't just wait until they burst and then take the picture. You want to see them travel from the ground up. Yeah. If, if they're going to be the kind that light up there. Or even when they burst in the air and they're going to take a little bit of time to spread out. So you need to make sure you kind of get into a rhythm of timing it. Three to four seconds is usually my sweet spot. And that may be three to four seconds for one frame. Or it could be that I've got my exposure left open and I just take the cover off of my lens, in my case, a black hat, and just take it off and knock out one, two, three, four. And as soon as it's done, I'm putting it back on because the next burst may or may not be something I want to capture. Okay. See, I haven't, I've used a black hat once or twice. It was actually, it wasn't mine. I don't wear hats and I never remembered to pack one. It, it's a great tool to use. My exposures tends to be, my shutter tends to be open for 30 to 45 seconds. That seems to be my sweet spot. Now, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. We mentioned smoke, and yes. smoke depends on if there's a breeze or not. It could be blowing in some direction, or if there's no breeze, it could just get stagnant there. It kind of depends on how you time it. It's When the firework goes off and it bursts, and it lights up that smoke, like maybe if it's got a color to it, that could be interesting, or it could just ruin everything else. Yeah, but maybe put more emphasis on trying to shoot early on if smoke is likely to be an issue. And smoke is going to be an issue, so expect smoke it's going to build up as it goes. So your first shots are the ones that you really want to kind of try and, and capture before the smoke builds up. And if you got a breeze, there may be a, a pause or a lull in the show, and maybe you can go ahead and get some more shots without yes. all the smoke in there. The other part is sometimes these things on holidays get really crowded in the in the popular areas. Try to set up your tripod so nobody's going to bump into it. Yeah. Legs through railings work quite well if you're able to do that against the wall, like a solid wall. In our case, we like to go to Walt Disney World, and there's just a ton of tourists around there watching the shows every night. People don't mean to bump into you, but it can happen. So yeah. just try to try to pick a spot and, and not be in the thick of things if you can. Yes. And finally, one other thing we wanted to talk about that some photographers like to use is a neutral density filter. You just mentioned that a little while ago. Yes, I almost exclusively shoot fireworks with one. Be careful what neutral density filter you use because you've got a you got a story where you failed on. I, I got burned. I figured I wasn't going to spend a hundred bucks on a neutral density filter. That was just insane. It was the first time I was using fireworks. I got a cheap one for I don't recall. It was maybe twenty five, thirty bucks. I thought there was dirt on my camera. I kept cleaning the lens. It turned out it was the filter. So I lost all the photos I'd taken. I ended up buying the more expensive, not not top of the range, but I went and got a, a good quality one and spent some cash on it. I couldn't even begin to describe the difference. And some neutral density filters or some of the, the cheaper ones 
can put a color cast on your photos. Yes, and flare. There was like a weird flare and like a smoky look. It was like when you get a dirty lens and you wipe it and you get smears. It, it was strange. So my suggestion is if you're going to use a neutral density filter, test it first. Don't make the fireworks your first time using a given neutral density filter. You want to know that you can trust it before you go out to a one-time event. Yes, or, and you don't have to buy the most expensive neutral density filter, but get something that's got good reviews and I can pretty much guarantee if you're looking at the bottom of the line, no name stuff on Amazon or eBay, you're likely to get burned with something like this. I'll usually go with Tiffin or Lee filters, something that I recognize and I've purchased and used before. Yes. Hopefully that gives you enough information. If this is your first time shooting fireworks, if you have questions, let us know. And if you've got uh, some shots that you really enjoyed, give us a link in the comments at williambeam.com slash episode 56. Thank you for listening to the Photo Flunky Show. As usual, show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 56, and you can find a free transcript of the show there. You can subscribe to the Photo Flunky Show at iTunes, Google Play, Music, Blueberry, Stitcher Radio. Links are available at photoflunky.com. Thank you so much. We'll look forward to seeing you again next week. <laughs>